I'll just mention there's a couple of seats down here, just while Robert's getting ready. Um, there's a couple of seats down here if anybody wants to come in. Um, I've got one, two, three, four, five seats over here if anybody wants to come forward. I'll give you a chance to... Uh, there, yeah, one, two, three, four, five seats here. This, if anybody from the back wants to get a seat, there's still some seats down here. Okay. Okay. There's, there's a couple of seats here if you want to come and sit down. There's still two more just, just in there on the third row as well. So, okay. Okay, Robert, well, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. I think everyone's looking forward to hearing your presentation. So, um, Robert, take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, what's going on here? <laughs> Don't tell me we're in one of these things where it's gonna automatically go forward on me. Um, I'll try not to let it do that. Um, so lots of you know, you know, in the past, I, most of my software development has been very public, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I've been doing lately. And in this particular instance, and partly why we're in the technology track, the software that actually drives most of this is very proprietary. And that's not because, uh, in particular, we want to keep it away from anybody else, but, but really because there's no other operation that looks quite like our operation. Um, it's it's a, amazingly specific to a company, and so making it public wouldn't actually help anybody out. Um, but most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, you can sort of do yourself at home. The UK Biobank is a, is a fabulous resource. They make their data amazingly public, and almost everything I'm doing you can do there. It's just on a, a slightly different scale, but it's it's, is really pretty useful um, as, as a, an approach. So, um, and then one thing to be really clear about, almost none of this work I'm going to talk about is mine directly. We have lots of folks at the company that do lots of it. Um, and I'm going to start by leading you through a little bit of what we do at 23andMe just in general, and then uh, hopefully move fairly quickly into the, the sort of therapeutic work that I'm doing there, which is where I spend most of my time. So 23andMe is a company that was formed about 14 years ago. It was formed by Ann Wojcicki. Um, and her mission is, is sort of a nice one. And it's really, in some ways, very nice to work at a company that's sort of mission-oriented. So our mission is to help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. And it, you know, in some sense, when I go to work in the morning, I sort of look at what I'm doing. And if it doesn't line up with one of the things here, then I'm probably not doing what I ought to be doing uh, at that particular time. And most of the part that I do is here under the benefit part now. It's, we, you know, we're going to use genetics and genomics to try to uh, discover novel therapeutics for unmet medical need. And ultimately, that will help people to benefit from the human genome. And we use the human genome very directly in our process. And uh, as you watch out in the world, you'll start to see, uh, I think, more and more pharma is moving in the exact same direction, that there are real benefits in drug development and drug discovery to integrating genetics more completely with what we're doing. And so this sort of at a high level, if I think about, you know, sort of life before Genentech and then 23andMe, we did a, I did a lot of work on what I would think of as functional genomics. And really what we need to do as a discipline moving forward is to figure out how are we going to wed that functional genomics into human genetics um, and use the two of them to the best effect that we can. And that is going to be a sort of a big problem and it's going to take us quite a long time to, to get it done really well. All right, so what's happening at 23andMe? Just some company highlights. We now have 10 million customers. We have about 8 million usable genomes. Um, we have over 2 billion survey questions, so almost all of our data collection, but not all of it, is uh, self-reported. And, and I won't go into it very much today, but I'm happy to talk at the end with people who want to know how good it is. It has 
went wind reliably and best places to work. We have a very active research department. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. We do lots of academic collaboration. So those of you that are geneticists, you know, you should be watching our website for the academic collaboration opportunities. We run two cycles a year. Um, we, uh, and, and Anne has been very insistent on this, and folks will have seen us in the news probably about five years ago. Um, we're, we're the only company that's authorized by the FDA to take something out of your genome, put it in a report, and give it back to you. Um, and, and that sort of took a, a fair amount of wrangling with the FDA, but Anne feels extremely strongly that we don't need doctors or other folks in between our genome and the information that it provides us with regard to medical risk and that having anybody in between you and that data actually changes the conversations you get to have and changes your ability to sort of regulate your own health care. And so on the consumer side, that's sort of the, the big piece. But as I said, I don't work much on the consumer side. There are three interconnected businesses at 23andMe. So there's the consumer one. You give us some amount of money. We'll send you a little package. I'll show you it in a second. You spit into it. You spit an awful lot into it. It's a, it's a pretty big tube. You send it back. We will genotype you. We don't typically do whole genome sequencing at the present time. I'll again talk a little bit about some of the work we do there. But in general, we're genotyping people and imputing. That's uh, for folks that don't know about human genetics. That's as close to a free lunch as one can possibly get. And then off of that, we do research. So we have a number of both paid and unpaid research collaborations. And then about four years and, and three or four months ago, I joined along with Richard Scheller, who was the head of uh, sort of research and early development at Genentech, had a long history in pharma of developing drugs. And I was at Genentech at the same time. We joined 23andMe with the express purpose of taking the genetic database and trying to figure out how do we do drug discovery in that. And so now we're about four years along. We have active programs, I think 13 of them now, in a variety of disease areas at different stages. We have not yet filed for an IND, which is the precursor to going into people, but we're, you know, we're doing as well as you'd expect to do in four years, given that we, we came with absolutely nothing. And I fully anticipate in the next year or two that we will be um, able to start putting the therapeutics we've been developing into humans. How does it work? As I said, you order it, we mail it to you, you get this tube, you spit in the tube, you seal it up, put it back in the mail, it goes to a lab in either North Carolina or Los Angeles, they extract DNA from the saliva, and then they run it out on an uh, Illumina uh, array, and they send that genotype data to us where we process it, produce all of the reports, and you basically can log into the website and do all sorts of things. You can learn about ancestry. You can find people that are related to you. And then there's a whole bunch of reports on different both medical and non-medical conditions. All right, so that's sort of as much as I'm going to say about the public side. Now let me talk a little bit about research. So research at 23andMe is really based on a relationship that we have with all of our customers. So there's no um, attempt at the company in, in any way to disguise from a customer that we're doing active research, that we're developing therapeutics. Customers see big consent forms that are very explicit about what they are and aren't consenting to. Um, it's an opt-in, not an opt-out. Um, and some, some of you may be aware, about a year ago, almost to the day, we uh, signed a deal with GSK where we're doing joint drug discovery with, those, with, with that company. And on that day, Anne sent an email to all of our customers with a clickable link. If you didn't want to participate, you could just do that. So we're really not trying to you know, make it hard to get out or make it unobvious what we're actually trying to do. And the reason why that turns out to be really successful is that most people that have either diseases themselves or relatives that have diseases understand how few good drugs there are. And the only way that we will ever solve this problem and make the best drugs for the right people is by having not 10 million customers, but 100 million customers or 200 million customers. We need amazing amounts of phenotype and genotype and Without that, drug discovery will go amazingly slowly, and with that, drug discovery will start to pick up pace and go somewhere. All of our research from the very start has been covered by an IRB, so we 
and many other pharma. So if you're doing research on humans, you need an IRB to approve that. And there are external IRBs that you can hire. We pay the IRB money to review our protocols and give us advice on what we're doing. Customers are allowed to end their participation at any time. You can go in and change your consent any time you log into the website. We have an app on the phone and exactly the same thing on the phone. You have access in about two clicks to the, to the um, uh, consent forms that you've signed and you can review them and understand them and we try to provide both the legalese version and the, and the easy to understand, here's what we're trying to do. We have asked customers and a number of them have consented to share individualized data. We don't do that very often. I'll give you an example in this talk of where we are doing it and it's mainly for the benefit of, of, of people not at 23andMe. Um, in general, when we share data with academic collaborators or others, we share only aggregated and de-identified data. What are the advantages to this? Well, well, we're standing here, probably a few thousand people have finished doing surveys online at 23andMe, um, and so it's just totally trivial for participation. It's very straightforward for us to develop new surveys and new tools to collect information from people and put them up and basically get recruitment, and so now we're moving very quickly. I think our first billion data points took over 10 years and we generate about two to three billion data points a year now. So it's, it really accelerates and you're allowed, you, you, you can sort of move out pretty quickly. Uh, another advantage to online research is that geography is not a barrier, so you're not only getting phenotypes from people that live close to service centers or in metropolitan areas, you can get data from all over the place and it allows you to include people in multiple studies. Database demographics, so we are largely European at, by genotype, not by location. Most of our customers are in the United States. Uh, about 12% are Latino, 4% African American, 4% East and South Asian, and then 7% are admixed or other. Um, even at 4% of 10 million people, that's the probably the world's largest genotyped and phenotyped African-American population. It gives us an ability to start doing research in non-European populations where we all know there's lots of genetic diversity and there's lots of unmet medical need. Sex distribution, so early days it was more men than women, it's now more women than men. Um, and if you look at the distribution by age, you can see it's quite bimodal. There are young people who are essentially interested in the measured self, as, as near as one can tell, and then older folks who, you know, as, as those of you that aren't old yet will find out, your, your mind wanders towards healthcare as you uh, age. Um, and it's remarkably bimodal. Uh, my own guess of what's happening in the middle is that those are the people that are having children and they're far too busy to do this. And certainly that was my experience with children. Um, just again to give you a bit of a sense of what kinds of things might we be able to do with this size of data. So we have almost 20,000 people who've self-reported Parkinson's disease. We have over a million people who are APOE4 carriers or homozygotes. We have 107,000 people who've reported skin cancer of some form that's not skin cancer. Um, folks, I hope some have seen our depression paper. We worked with academic groups to get the first GWAS where you could get significant variants associated with depression, but you needed a scale like this of you know, half a million to a million cases and a few million controls in, able, in order to be able to start to get GWAS hits for these weaker phenotypes, et cetera. All right, so we have a whole bunch of different research efforts. There's the Global Genetics uh, Project. So if you haven't thought about it very much, there's not a map out there that tells me these genotypes are associated with individuals from this country or that region of the world. And to do that, we have to build it. And so we go and recruit people with uh, strong ancestry into particular countries, particular regions, particular ethnicities. We recruit them tell them what we're going to do, sequence the, those individuals in particular, and use those as the foundation for identifying the parts of genomes for other people who signed up who might be more admixed, who might have one parent from one country and another parent from another country. We have done lots of population collaborations. I'll spend a little bit of time on the African American sequencing project, but, but just in broad strokes before we get there, we in about three years ago applied to the NIH 
to get funding to sequence about 2,000 African Americans in our database with the express purpose of um, uh, recruiting them and consenting them to share that data with bona fide uh, researchers. Um, and so the data have now been sequenced and they're going up and I can't remember whether they're going to be at ERA or DB Gap. I think it's going to be at DB Gap and so that we're in the process of transferring them there. So folks who want to use those whole genome sequences to build imputation panels will be able to download and, and, and use those. And then we're also working on Native American Latino um, sequencing projects, uh, again, a population for which there isn't good sequence data available and you can't impute genotypes if you don't have uh, good resources, so we're working on that as well. Rather remarkably, when we applied after we got the African, when we went back to the NIH to ask them to support the Native American Latino one, they said no, which kind of stunned us, but what can you do? All right, so now I'm going to switch and talk about three different things in therapeutics that I've been working on just to give you a flavor of what we're doing and, and how it's going. So there have been a, a few papers out uh, in, in the not very recent past where folks have started to look at approved drugs and ask, you know, I, I'm sure all of you have heard the, the rough cost. It's about a billion dollars from the first thing that you do till you get an approved drug, right? So this is a pretty big cost and not very many things actually get through that pipeline. So the best way to improve things is to actually improve the ultimate probability that you have a successful therapeutic. And if you look at drugs for or conditions for which the drug and its target have good genetic evidence of the involvement of that target in the disease that you care about, then those succeed at a rate about one and a half to two times other. So this is sort of the, the real basis for the start of Richard and I being interested in moving away from a traditional drug company into one that used human genetics much more directly. Um, but it's also part of the reason why Anne was interested and it's a lot of the reason why GSK wanted to do a partnership with us and why almost all other pharma want to do these things. And one of the reasons for that, and you know, sort of I'm gonna tell you a little story that's, you know, sort of probably close to, to true, there are exceptions to it along the way, but if, if you think about how you make a drug in pharma, right, the traditional model has always been a biologist who knows an awful lot about genes and disease says, ah, this gene looks like a really good gene, we should, we should be thinking about it for this disease. And what they'll do is they will then get some cell lines and they will perturb that gene in those cell lines and they will see what happens and if what they're trying to do is kill the, the cell lines and they manage to do that, they get a little bit excited. And then they move to a mouse or other model organism and they say, okay, can I perturb this gene in this mouse or in this, uh, you know, hamster or whatever, right? And then they say, ah, look, I can perturb that gene in this model organism and I see a phenotype that I like that's consistent with, you know, what I think is going to go on. So that's great. And then and then they basically have to do their IND enabling and toxicology studies and they make sure that the, the drug is, you know, passes through those and then, and then you go to the NIH and you say, okay, I have an idea for a drug and I want to put it in people. And so if it's been shown to be safe, right, that's the only thing that, that the FDA cares about. It has to be shown to be safe. They don't care about efficacy. That's our job. We have to care about efficacy. We can then go and do what's called a phase one trial, which is really just a dose finding trial. Well, there's no efficacy in many cases. This is done in humans without the disease just to make sure that the thing is actually safe and to give us a sense of how much drug can we give to somebody before they start to have any kind of symptoms that, that might be bad. And so there we are. We're in that, that whole process will take you six or seven years. It will cost you on the order of two or three hundred million dollars. And at that point in time, you have absolutely no idea that perturbing that gene in a human causes a phenotype, because you've never done that experiment. But if you start with genetics, where you have a good idea that the genotype has actually perturbed the, the, the gene of interest, and you see a phenotype, you start knowing that perturbing that gene in a human causes a phenotype. And the easiest ones, of course, are the ones where we see, you know, a mutation in a gene that's loss of function, right? Then we know for sure that perturbing that gene in a human causes a phenotype. So that's really what you're trying to do with human genetics, is bring it back to the point where you get a sense of, 
I know already that perturbing this thing in humans does something, and therefore if I make a drug that mimics that, I can expect to see something similar to that happening, and I don't have to suspend that disbelief for quite as long. Um, and that's, I think, a lot of what will drive this. Okay. So we use both GWAS and something called FIWAS. One of the previous speakers talked about FIWAS. And basically, you can think of GWAS as saying, I have a whole bunch of people that either have a disease or they don't have a disease, and I'm going to walk along the genome, and at every locus, I'm going to do a, a, a test on a two-by-two two table. What's your genotype at that locus, and what's your disease status? And whenever that test is significant enough, I'll say, aha, I have a genome-wide significant hit. This variant seems to associate with risk for disease. I want to look at that part of the genome and see if I can understand why. And FIWAS goes the other way. So when you're a company like 23andMe where we have something in the order of 15 or 1600 phenotypes, we can actually say for a given locus in the genome, how many diseases are associated with that and in what direction, or how many phenotypes are associated with that. And that allows me to do a couple of things that are quite helpful because if a variant in the genome causes one disease, it should cause other similar diseases. It should be associated with them. And we see lots of that. We also see other things, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that as we go forward. So that allows us to find loci in the genome that associate with disease to then try to understand, well, what's actually causing it? This, in, at least for us, we call the fine mapping problem, and it's the hardest problem there is. Um, and in lots of cases, nobody has managed to resolve that, so we have lots of GWAS hits for which nobody knows what the actual functional consequence of the genetic change is, so they don't know how to develop a drug. Okay. We want to do two things. I want to actually do even more than that. I want to say this variant in the genome associates with disease. It changes this particular gene, and it either makes it work better, which is what we'll call a gain of function, or it makes it work worse, which is what we'll call a loss of function. Almost all drugs that you can buy are drugs that induce a loss of function. So what we're really looking for are these very rare instances where I find a place in the genome where the variant, I can figure out what gene it is exactly, and I know that I have a loss of function and that that reduces the risk of disease. If that happens, then that is almost by definition a drug target, and pretty much every pharma faced with that observation would be out having their chemists or their molecular biologists working actively on it. And so this is really what we're doing. We take all the phenotypes we can, all the genotypes we can, look through them. We have, somebody told me the other day, and I'm trying to remember, we have something on the order of 60,000 genome-wide significant hits in relevant medical diseases, and we're hoping out of those there's a small handful, maybe three or four a year, for which we can figure out exactly what gene it is, exactly what direction it is, and that the gene is druggable and we can, we can do something. All right, so I'll spend a little bit of time. I've already talked a lot about this slide. So drugs are basically substances that have physiological effects. There are different mechanisms of action. The agonist is one that stabilizes or increases function. So you can think of if somebody has type 1 diabetes, we will give them insulin. In that case, insulin is a drug. For most of us that don't have diabetes, insulin is just a, a hormone, right? Or a but for those people, I'm giving them insulin. It's a drug. It makes them better. Those are rare, but not impossible. Antagonists, those are ones I give you a drug and it makes something not work. As I said, that's the most common and in some sense the easiest. It's probably one of these laws of thermodynamics. It's much easier to break things than it is to make them work better, right? And so that's what it is. And then there are other much more complicated mechanisms, but really if you, if you want to go somewhere fast and cheap, the drugs that you want to make are the antagonist drugs. Those are the sort of, in some sense, real low-hanging fruit, and so you're searching as hard as you can for those. And if you can't get enough of those, you can go for agonists. Again, things like insulin. If I can figure out there's a protein that if I inject it into your body, it would make you healthier, that's, again, a fairly standard thing that you can do these days. It doesn't require huge amounts of effort. You can actually, if you knew what it was, you could find a CRO that would make it. You, would, you could actually do all of this from your sort of 
living room or dining room table, you could phone up people and have them, given sufficient amounts of cash, have them do everything and get yourself pretty close to a, an approved drug without actually ever knowing anything about it. And people are starting to do that. All right, I'm going to skip over that. There are two kinds of molecules. There are large molecules. These are antibodies or proteins. I'm going to talk mostly about antibodies. This is largely what Genentech makes. Antibodies are much easier to make than anything else. Small molecules are harder to make. Antibodies work better. You can dial in specificity the way that you want it. You can control half-life the way that you want it. And you can really reduce off-target effects. Here's a, in some sense, the, to the size here. So this is uh, 150,000 Daltons. These things don't go inside of cells. So the best they're going to do is bind to something outside of cells. And then here's an aspirin at 180 Daltons. So small molecules, if you take a pill, that reduces down to some tiny little thing. And that little thing diffuses across the cell membrane and into the cell of every cell in your body. And so the problem that we face in drug development with small molecules is that we'll get off-target effects. That small molecule does exactly what I want it to to the protein that I'm interested in, but it turns out that there are other proteins that I didn't know about or didn't think about where it will bind to those and cause all sorts of bad things to happen. With antibodies, we know they're not going into cells, so they're going to bind to things on the outside of cells, and they will inhibit function in general, but they can also uh, induce functions. If they bind to a cell surface receptor that causes an action inside of the cell, you can make them cause things. You can make a similar antibody that will stop that transduction from happening, etc. They tend to be safer, but they're not 100% safe. And there are antibodies that if you inject them into synomologous monkeys, for example, when you're doing your IND enabling toxicology studies, they will be lethal for the monkeys, right? And one presumes that they would then be lethal for a human. In both cases, when we develop drugs forward, when we see adverse toxicology events, the first thing that you try to do is to understand, are they on target or off target? If it's an on target tox event, then you have to shut the program down because you've hit the thing you want to, you're not hitting anything else, and it's lethal, so therefore it can never really be a drug. We would not be able to or, or want to put it in humans. But we sometimes see off target toxicology and when we, or uh, toxicity. And when we see that, we'll take the molecule back and ask, can we engineer around that because we really like that gene for that pathway and we think that it's important to try to, to move that forward. And typically what happens with small molecules, just so folks know, is you know, if you think of your protein, these are just three, the blue, the cyan blob there, which looks a bit bluer than cyan up here, is the protein. And then the little bright colored red or yellow thing are the molecular structure, right? And so you're sort of trying to make a small molecule that binds into that pocket. And then when the protein is trying to interact with something else, it's unable to because this thing is stuck in there. And as I said, the problem is, OK, so I understand the gene I'm trying to target. And I've got a nice map of it, and I know how to get something in there. But I don't know whether that something sticks in a similar pocket in any other protein. And I, it's very hard to find that out for humans without testing in things that look like human. As I said, the way that antibodies work is that they target extracellular membranes. This is the Herceptin drug for breast cancer from Genentech, for example, is one of exactly one of these. In certain types of breast cancer, there's a, a, a cell surface receptor, HER2, that is highly amplified. And the tumor itself is very dependent on having that HER2 signaling happening all the time. So if you could make an antibody that blocked it, which is exactly what Genentech did, you basically can reduce the tumor quite dramatically. And so lots of pharma goes out and looks for those things. We have a number of other antibody targets where your immune system, either B cells or T cells, are overly active. And if you can find antibodies that slow them down or make them not react in a particular way, again, this is, is perfectly possible. And these tend to be well t tolerated. So you see advertisements on TV for them for you know, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. And if you have a serious enough case of these that small molecules don't help you, you will end up on a, 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 an injectable, right? And so to be clear, antibodies are injectable, small molecules you take. Um, and so most people prefer small molecules. They don't like having needles. But it turns out that injectables really do change the, 
the course of disease, and in some cases, uh, especially again, a, a Genentech drug, Lucentis, for acute macular degeneration has moved it from being the leading cause of blindness in the developed world to being a, 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 one of the very uh, low causes of blindness in the developed world, because if you're willing to get this antibody injected into your eye, will stop progression of that disease, and it's, it really is an amazing drug. Okay. So as I said, the problem is how do we solve the fine mapping problem? We want to basically design a therapeutic. I need to know what the causal gene is and what can I do that, how can I do that? So we use expression quantitative traits. So if I show that the change in the genome is associated with a change in expression of a, the gene, then I can say, aha, well maybe it's that gene, the same variant that was my GWAS hit is associated in relatively healthy humans with a change in expression of that gene. And the inference there is, okay, so the people with the variant that causes disease were exposed to high levels of this protein over a long period of time. That might be the thing that caused the disease, and so that protein becomes a target. We'd like to look at whether decreasing that um, by drugging it, de decreasing its function, might help alleviate the disease. That's one of the main. Or we might see a mRNA where a particular exon is spliced in or out depending on genotype. And again, there are reasonably large numbers of these. And again, the idea would be that that particular change was somehow related either to risk of disease or disease progression, but we have this temporal thing. We know that the genotype came first, we know that they have this exposure over a long period of time and they get the disease, and so we're able to sort of draw the line between the, this genotype in, in a sort of a hopeful causal way to the disease. The problem, if you go back to, you know, when I was doing a lot of oncology where you do tumor normal or diseased and undiseased, if you just do differential expression, you're stuck there not knowing whether you're looking at passengers or drivers and you don't have any sort of inferential piece on which to hang your hat. Now, it does seem to me to be sort of a little bit obvious that a lot of those differential expression analyses might benefit by people going back and starting to look at the GWAS catalog and asking if I see a gene that's differentially expressed between the normal state and the disease state and I can map it back to a SNP that is causing that change in expression and I can map that to the GWAS catalog, I would again get some prioritization, but that will be challenging. The EQTL and SQTL data sets tend to be quite small on the order of hundreds. That means I can't really look for EQTLs for rare SNPs because a rare SNP is one in a thousand. I only have a hundred people that I've managed to measure, so we have to find ways to overcome that. That's sort of one of the biggest challenges. And then other modalities I'm sure people have been talking about here, so epigenetic marks, promoter capture high C, attack seek, we are now uh, at, at the scale we are at, for some diseases, we can run male-specific GWASs and female-specific GWASs, and we see variants that are significant only in men and variants that are significant only in women, and trying to understand that, again, as a process to help us do drug development will be important. Um, and, and in those cases, those variants will actually be quite attenuated if you don't basically do the sex-specific GWASs, and so you'll be passing over a whole bunch of variants that you would have found associated with disease. They will be on, only in one sex. That doesn't always mean that the drug won't work in both sexes. It just means that the target won't be found if you don't do the deeper one. And then we've been using promoter capture high C. I'll talk a little bit about that in the vignette uh, uh, that give you hints about it. All right. So the first story, this was one of our very first targets. We are not working on it anymore, and I'll show you in the next slide why. Um, it's been known as a genetic hit for a long time, but almost nobody knew what it was actually doing, and so we figured out what was actually going on. We identified, and I'll show you, I hope, through a series of things, that this was one of the variants where we could say, aha, we're pretty sure it's this gene, and that loss of function is protective. But Sadly, about a year after we had figured that out and started, and we're a small company of size about 
uh, at that time maybe 30 people, a really big company uh, called Regeneron published a paper where they had you know, done what Big Pharma does, which is just throw huge amounts of money at the problem and they managed to, to solve this. So you'll see our story. You should read this paper if you're interested. It's really a fantastic paper. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of what extent they went to. From our side, we didn't spend any money. We didn't do any special assays. We just analyzed the data a little bit more carefully. Um, and we got to the same spot, but we were sort of stuck once they published. Um, so this SNP, SNPs all have a, in general, have an RS in front of them and some long sequence of numbers, was associated with low serum levels of alanine aminotransferase. It had been a loss of function variant is associated with reduced risk of alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic liver disease, alcoholic cirrhosis, non-alcoholic cirrhosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, but not steatosis. So it, variants in this gene are associating with some kind of liver disease, and those variants, as it turns out, the loss of function variants are actually protective. So this is, as I said earlier, this sort of fantastic place to be. We have a really good target. We know that, re that basically developing a drug in the way that's fairly straightforward is likely to be of some benefit. And for folks that don't know, NASH and NAFLD are two diseases which are way underdiagnosed and are, at least in the US and probably in Europe, over the next 15 or 20 years likely to be some of the leading causes of death because we have an awful lot of people who have really big problems with their liver that are unaware of it. The diagnosis is, I think, under 10% of people with these diseases know they have it. And by the time they know they have it, they need a, a liver transplant. I'll walk through a few things. So we do something that's a little more complicated, and I, I don't want to try to go into it too much, but the way that the, the sort of human genetics community did things is they'd go along and they'd find this variant that associated with disease, and then because of the complexity, there's a lot of what's called LD structured variants are highly related to each other. They would sort of block out that region and then move on, and they wouldn't look for a second signal there. And in part, that was fine because they had very small sample sizes. But at the sample sizes we have, there's no reason to do that. And so when we find a signal, we basically then start with it, and add it into our model, and then ask, is there a second signal in that region? And if there is, then we add that, and we ask, is there a third signal in that after I've conditioned on the first two. So here what you'll see for elevated liver tests, that's the phenotype that we have. So we've asked people, has your doctor ever told you you have an elevated liver test? Um, and this was data, as I said, from about 19, six, uh, uh, 2016. Um, we had, at that time, 97,000 cases and 760,000 controls. We got this as the first hit. If we put that in the model in condition, we get another hit in the same locus. If we put that in the model, we get another hit in the same locus. And the advantage to doing this is I now have three things in that locus, and I can try to figure out if any one of them tells me exactly what gene it is or tells me the direction, that's fine. So I sort of now have three shots on goal there as opposed to one if I hadn't done that. And then NAFL, this is a non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease high triglycerides, so again, indications that you have liver problems, and you can see the ones and the twos after here are the hits. Here's a variant that we call that doesn't have an RSID, so it hasn't been reported and named yet, but we see a change. This is a splice site variant, um, and there's some people who have a C in that locus, and then some people who have this other much longer string in that locus, so there's sort of a deletion. High cholesterol, et cetera. All right, so this is, again, a picture. So now what I've done is that picture on the biggest one on the far left is the genome. Every blue cross or every cross or plus in that is a SNP in the genome. So we're looking in the locus of HSD17B13. We're looking at the phenotype high triglycerides, and this is our primary signal. Then when I put this in the model and do it again, I get a new hit that's over here that's now right on top of HSD17P13. And that was sort of right from this picture. You can see we're, we're way over here, and you might think this is actually the gene, but it may not be. It may actually just be a regulatory site for the actual gene. This says, well, there's some signal that now looks it's much more localized over 
that one, and then a third step. And then we can do the same thing for elevated liver test. And so here you can see, again, same part of the genome, different phenotype, and now in this case, the variant is right on top of our gene, right? And so again, giving us some confidence that we're narrowing in on the, the one that we really like. And then for NAFLD, this is the primary hit, and then the secondary hit is this one here, which is a X. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, there's a difference. A plus is just the genotype, and X says I've got a coding variant. So now on the second hit, I'm actually seeing a coding variant in the gene that's associating with disease, and that's, you know, in some sense as good as it's ever going to get. So then we switch over and look at what we call the FEWAS. This is a fairly simplified version of things. So here what we have across this axis are the variants in that gene, and across this axis are the different um, phenotypes, and we can see that high triglycerides are, in some sense, if this, this SNP here has a very strong association in one direction with high triglycerides and very strong associations in the other direction with elevated liver tests. And again, that's exactly the way that it should be. These variants in here are ones that are either a splice site variant, this one here is annotated that way and we'll see that that's important in just a second, or what's called in high LD, so they're strongly associated. If you have whatever the variant is that is at, at this locus, then the chance that you have the same one here and here and here is high, they're, they're correlated. I don't know what these ones are at, but probably over 60 or 70 percent. And then this one here, blue cluster, are conditional associations that um, co-localize with this other variant, which is a missense variant in the gene. So we have some SNPs that associate with the missense variant and some that associate with the splicing factor. And what we'd like to know is what's going on with the splicing factor, and that was quite challenging. I'm going to jump over these in the interest of time um, and really try to spend a few minutes talking about this odd SNP, which is in an alternate splice site, but when you looked at the data, all, all of the RNA-seq mappers were truncating the reads, and it looked like the reads were truncating at a particular spot, and the, the, what, what really goes on there is that there's sort of a, in, in a lot of the mappers, there's this soft clipping thing that if you try to align it and it doesn't, you're near the end of the read and it doesn't look good, you sort of cut it off a lot of the time. And that turned out to be a bad idea because this was a non-canonical spice site and if you went back to the, the actual BAMs and looked at them, all of these reads that looked like they were truncated at that place actually had more sequence there. And what we were able to show is, is shown, sort of shown here in this little graphic, so here's our exon, exon junction, here's the observed sequence, so you can either be the wild type, about 99%, uh, and so if you're that, then this is the sequence of the protein that you're going to have, but as soon as you go, and, and everybody's going to be this one, as soon as you're heterozygote, so you can either be a T or a TA at that locus, right, that changes things and half of your reads look like the top one and half of them look like the bottom one where you get a nonsense mutation just shortly after that. And then if you're homozygote for this TA, TA allele, then almost all of your reads are these bottom ones. And so we were able to show that that variant, again in this case, the risk, the, the protective allele was the one that's down here at the bottom and so we became quite confident that it was a loss of function variant that was associated with disease. And, and this is the place where Regeneron, if you look in their paper, spent a lot of money doing very long sequencing to try to figure out what was going on because it was an amazingly confusing locus. And if you did long enough sequence reads, it became apparent that this was exactly what was happening. Safety evaluation, the other thing we can do, there's a great website at the Broad, either Exact or Nomad, depending on which version you're looking at, where they've done exome sequencing on lots and lots of humans. And one of the things that you can ask is, okay, if this, if drugging, if loss of function is good, can I drug this gene? And one of the ways that you can answer that question is to go and say, well, are there human knockouts, right? If there are lots of humans who are homozygote knocked out for that gene, then it's probably fine to drug it, right? 
If you can't find human knockouts, then you should start to get worried about whether drugging it is going to be okay. And so when we went and looked, and here again is this sort of real call out to why we need more genetic diversity, the minor allele is amazingly rare in Europeans, right? It's a, you know, 0.04% allele, right? So you're not going to find out very much, and you're very unlikely to find homozygote knockouts in Europeans, but it's a point, almost 0.2% allele in African Americans, and so for whatever reason, there's genetic diversity, and that diversity helps us because we will then be able to look and see, and in that, there were 209 individuals who had been sequenced in NOMAD who are essentially one presumes reasonably normal walking around humans for which they were homozygote deleted. And so you can start to think that, okay, you know, it's not going to get you out of doing everything else, but you can really start to believe that drugging this gene is unlikely to be lethal for, for humans. All right, so the summary of that, right, so we showed we and others, this was well known before I, I even went to 23andMe, that variants in this gene showed significant association with different liver diseases. We showed that the most common p-value was a 27% minor allele variant, um, that it's a verified splicing variant, and we showed that it leads to loss of function and reduced the risk of NAFLD and, NAF NAF and NAFLD. A conditional hit, so after we condition on that frequent SNP, we find another one that co-localizes with a less common 6% mile minor allele allele frequency coding change, and we showed that, right, so the problem there is it's just a change of function. We don't know whether it's loss of function, and so it's hard for us to interpret coding changes as gain of function or loss of function without doing some wet lab work. So we, you know, can show some things. We, as I said, use NOMAD to convince ourselves that this is probably safe, and these are the sorts of things that we want to do before we start doing any work, even in cell lines, right? We don't want to spend too much money, and so we want to try to really tie things together. And so out of all that data, we came up with a reasonable internal story that this was going to be the implicated gene in this locus. All right. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Po no, point uh, two percent. Point two percent. Point two percent. Is there a significant decrease in liver diseases in that population? Is mm. that known? It's too. It's. It's a great question. So the, the question was okay. So this is much more common, right? But it's still only point two percent. So it's. You would not observe it at a, at a epidemiological scale. It's. It's too small. But there are other. Var I mean, we. If, if you. Um, Variants that are co more common in African Americans, for example, are in the anemia ones, right? So sickle cell disease is a variant that's, right, it's very rare in Europeans, but it's co more common in Africans, and yes, you do see those things. But for this one, it would be challenging to do that. Um, I, I think I have a picture in a bit about one of the kidney diseases. So there are kidney diseases that are known to be genetic, where the f minor allele frequency in Africans is much higher than Europeans, and you do see that increase of, of disease risk, absolutely. Any other questions? Oh, right behind you. So the statistics are really important when doing the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, so um, when you look at, um, for example, when you evaluate the p-value and consider something significant, and then when that uh, influences you to run a new statistical test, uh, the p-value there, uh, if computed with standard means, is no longer valid because it's conditioned on the observation of the significance of the p-value in the previous well, test. So how do you deal with these sort of statistical challenges? That, uh, yeah. So good yeah. question. So the, right, so the thing was, I selected the first SNP in some way that was potentially p-value associated. Now, given that I did that, how do I think about the conditional hits? You know, and the, the answer is, well, you know, you, you, again, try to find reasonable models. We're not doing that many tests, right? This is a very localized thing. Um, and so we use a slightly smaller uh, threshold uh, in that case. Now, w one of the things that I'm just going to throw out there, which is, is kind of important, we don't spend that much time worrying about p-values. P-values are not important to us in the sense that we are so overpowered for absolutely everything 
that p-value is not really what we should be doing. It's odds ratios and things like that that matter to us, not the, the p-value itself. So p-value is really a, a gigantic function of power, right? And that's one of the problems with most of, of the sort of GWAS studies that have been done um, is that, you know, if, if you do a differential expression experiment with RNA-seq, we learned, you know, 15 years ago that the genes that were differentially expressed were enriched for genes that had high expression, right? Hopefully that's not news to anybody. Why is that? Well, because I had more power when I had more expression, and therefore I had to worry in my analysis about, you know, the most differentially expressed gene with a p-value was not necessarily all that interesting, that, and there's no reason why that should be the one that's causing my disease. I had to accommodate for that. The same problem happens in GWAS studies, and nobody's worrying about the fact that, you know, yes, we find lots of common variants with low effect size. Why is that? Because that's where the power is. The advantage to conditional analysis in this case is that almost all of the conditional hits are low frequency variants with big odds ratios, which are ones that I'm far more interested in. An odds ratio of like 1.003, even if the p-value is minus 300, is not that striking, whereas a rare allele with a big odds ratio starts to get me slightly more interested. But it's a good question, and there are no, I, I don't have a, you know, answer. We didn't go and figure out a whole bunch of math to do. We're, basically you, you just using reasonably arbitrary thresholds to work our way through. All right. Uh, I will quickly talk about two other things. These are pretty, pretty quick and easy. So the high C assay, right, again, not news to anybody, I hope. When transcription happens in a cell, it doesn't happen, you know, with a you know, a, chrom a, a chromosome spread out straight. These things organize in three-dimensional structures. There's hot spots of transcription. And the notion of PC promoter or of high C was, oh, we should look at cross-linking the DNA and trying to understand which pieces of DNA were close to which other places so I could see transcription across them and, and start to understand how is transcription actually regulated in three dimensions in the cell. Fantastic assay, been around for a while. The problem with it is, if that's all you do, you get so many links, and many of them are non-functional because, yes, the, the, the chromosomes are set up, so the, the, the inactive stuff is basically sequestered to the lamin, the active part of the chromosome is down somewhere inside the cell, and there are lots of things there. And so lots of things are close to each other, but it doesn't mean they're doing very much. So you got tons and tons of hits. So somebody suggested, well, why don't I just, instead of taking all of the hits, why don't I find known promoters and basically, after I've done my PC, enrich for the known promoters. So this PC high C gets me many fewer things, but it's trying to find links between DNA that is relatively far away from a promoter but comes to a promoter. And for us, that's important. Uh, let me just get to the cartoon, right? So you could imagine that there's some intergenic enhancer over here when in three dimensions it's brought up really close to the promoter and it actually actively transcribes things. So a GWAS variant over here will almost never be linked to this gene because there's too big of a distance and we didn't understand that in the three-dimensional structure it's actually close. So we're trying to use promoter capture high C to take GWAS hits that are a long way from any known gene and ask is there some evidence that in the three-dimensional structure they're actually located next to one. And then we can start to think about wet lab experiments that would say yes that's true or no that's not true because this is just an experimental one. The other famous place for um, enhancers to be which mislead you um, and FTO is, is a very classic example so again folks that do a little bit of genetics FTO is associated with BMI people have thought that it was long you know sort of odd as a gene to be associated with BMI and it turns out that it's the GWAS hit is actually in an enhancer for a nearby gene which is a known metabolic gene right and so classic assignment of a SNP in this little blue box here would be to whatever this gene is, but PC high C at times points us to another gene and suggests that the actual causal 
this, this ge just genetic variant here, if there was one, is actually driving some other gene. So again, these are tools that we're trying to use, as I said, to do this functional thing. How do I take a GWAS hit and really get confident about the, the gene that it's interacting acting with? So, and then I'll go back to this one here and just say, you know, so what are we trying to do? So we want to use promoter capture high C to link GWAS hits to likely functional genes, and that then allows us to think about how will we do wet lab experiments to prove that's right, and then given that we're right, we can go off and do other things. And as I said, there's really two things that we're doing, and this is sort of our own thing. So if a GWAS hit is really close to a gene, we don't want to do this because it doesn't make much sense, but if it's really a long way from anything and you have no idea you should do it, and then anything that we see in an intron, uh, we, we become quite interested in doing that same thing. And then the last piece here, and I'm almost done, I did want to say a few words about the African American Sequencing Project. So we did get an award from the NIH to do this. The goal of this, and we then, as I said, wrote out to our African American customers, asked them to participate. They would then come back and affirmatively consent that they would be willing to use their DNA in a sequencing study, and that that DNA would be then uploaded for scientists around the world to be able to use on applications, so we know they're bona fide uh, scientists, to do imputation. And then this improves all sort of researchers who are trying to work on imputation. Um, so we got whole genome sequence from 2,500. The data are going up. I, I tried to get whether we're at an accession number or not, but uh, we, we are somewhere in the process. We've finished sequencing, we've finished QC, and we're, we're actively trying to get it out in public. African Americans are admixed, so they're not the same as Africans in general. They'll have some non-African genotypes, and so what we did in the project was really to try to enrich as much as we could for folks that had African genome, because that was the unknown part. And for people that don't know, there's more genetic variation in Africa. That's a lot of what makes it interesting. And the LD blocks, the associations between SNPs, tend to be much shorter in Africa. And so both of these are, are really great things for understanding uh, uh, or solving that fine mapping problem that I've been talking about. So we got most of the cohort to be a median of about 80% African ancestry. And then we can take that data and impute and show that, in fact, we do exactly as we thought we would do. We find more variants at rare allele frequencies than other folks have been able to do. And again, this is really the ideal situation, right, because that allows us to start to study the genetic variation that associates with disease for more of these rare SNPs in African Americans. And I will, well, maybe I'll stop here. So we get lots of them. There were about 76 million, almost 77 million SNPs out of that, and then 44 million were non-singletons. You need, actually need to see something twice to be able to impute it well. And we found a bunch of indels, et cetera. And as I said, these, these will all be up for people to get. And then an example, so here's chronic kidney disease and APOL1. Somebody asked about this. Um, and really what happened um, is this gene is known to harbor African-specific allele risk for renal disease, and the top hit um, is a missent SNP actually in the gene, right? So we went from a GWAS where we got a hit near the gene and we had to do the, solve the fine mapping problem to now an example of exactly what we wanted, a variant coding change in the gene that's very suggestive that that's the one that we should be worrying about. And it's a very different frequency in Africans and then back to the other question and that's a good reason to believe that it's the causal one in the sense that it's differentially expressed. All right, so thanks very much for your attention. Happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Robert. We'll take some questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the great talk. Um, so for the GWAS study, we are mainly um, genotyping those common variants, and we are using all strategies like imputation and uh, fine mapping to find those driver, driver mutations. And my question is, are you planning to, or are you already using any deep learning alg uh, algorithms to the big GWAS study, big GWAS yeah. data? 
Got a great question. So we, we, we use a lot of machine learning algorithms at uh, 23andMe for a whole bunch of different things, uh, not specifically deep learning. Um, the, one of the really big advances in the last couple of years in human genetics are these highly polygenic risk scores. Um, and so what people have been doing is using thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of variants to see whether you can predict risk of disease off of those. And th that's sort of more the approach that, that we're using. And that turns out to be pretty useful for a, a variety of, of different activities. But we use machine learning for HLA and machine learning for, we, we have um, imputation, not genotype imputation, but phenotype imputation. We use machine learning for that as well. Hi. Um, has 23andMe considered reaching out to research groups in Africa and maybe working together with them to generate uh, African reference genomes? We, we have tried, um, and we, we're happy to keep trying. Yes, we would love to work with research groups in Africa who have access to individuals. I mean, we do everything with sort of you know, they're not patients, they're, they're customers, and so they need to have the 23andMe experience, and sometimes that can be challenging, but there's there's lots of collaboration we can do, and as I've said, we have two academic collaboration cycles per year, and I'm pretty confident anything from Africa would rise up pretty high. Okay, another question. We've got two more questions, sir. Just wondering if the African sequencing project data includes phenotypic data or just the sequencing data? Just the sequence data. We didn't, we did not, it was very challenging for us to figure out how and what phenotypes to ask people to provide. Our phenotyping is really dynamic and the genotyping is static and so we went with a simple model first and then we, we can sort of see how to build on that. So you did mention that you guys are doing some whole genome sequencing. So I was wondering like, what do you think would be the implication of doing whole genome sequencing at the scale of 23 and me on your work? Well, um, pr probably we'd bankrupt a whole bunch of really rich people um, and we wouldn't find anything that was very useful, um, which is pretty much why we don't do it. Um, we've, we've done some calculations and certainly in Europeans for a reasonably big database like ours, you want a sequence, you want a imputation sequence panel at about one to two percent of the size of your database and that is essentially optimal for cost and discovery. Africans is probably a bit different because of the issue, but, but then it would be like maybe 5%. But, you know, sadly, folks, almost all of us have genomes that are highly uninteresting, and spending lots of money to sequence that and to wrangle that and to deal with that turns out to be a, a big loss, right? It's the finding the people who are genetically remarkable and sequencing those is what you should be doing, and so we also have, I didn't talk about it today, but we have a rare disease initiative going on, and those are individuals where you do want to do whole genome sequencing because they have some very rare high penetrant disease, and you, you absolutely need to do whole genome sequencing to figure it out. But great question. Um, but yeah, if you think of it, it's $2,000 a person, plus or minus, and we have 10 million people, so, you know, it's getting to be real money. Okay, so thanks so much, Robert. Thank thanks so much for all those questions. Uh, great presentation.